All right. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I think I will bring us all uh, up uh, to date here and call the our meeting to order and establish a quorum. I can see that uh, we have a quorum setting around the table. So with that, we'll move on uh, to item number two. Uh, with approval of the agenda, I will ask for a motion and a second. Uh, Move to approve the agenda, Yolanda Avila. Thank second, you. Mayor Dixon. Thank you. We have a motion and a second. Uh, any discussion on today's agenda? With not, uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Excellent. Any opposed? I hear none. And uh, with that, I'll open the floor up uh, to public comment. Uh, I'll look uh, over to uh, our guest in the audience today, see if we have any public comment. Uh, we have the podium available. No public comment from inside. I'll look to see if we have anybody online. Mr. Chair, we do not have anyone online. We did not receive any request advance for public comment or any submitted public comment. Okay, thank you very much. And with that, I'll close uh, the public comment uh, session and uh, go on to item number four, approval of the minutes from our October 11th, 2023 meeting. I look for a motion and a second. Mayor Dixon, I'll move to approve. Holly, second. I have a motion and a second. Any Anyone want to uh, add or change anything to the minutes. With that, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? I hear none. The minutes are approved from our October meeting. Okay, moving along to item five, our Citizens Advisory Committee report, and I would ask uh, Jim to come forward. Jim Godfrey. Yeah, let's uh, come on up, though, so that uh, you can do that. The first thing we want to do is uh, recognize, now ask Pat to come up. So we want to re uh, recognize Richard Robertson, who we know has been on uh, the CAC for uh, four years and uh, uh, passed away last month. And uh, Pat is here today, and we welcome you, Pat, uh, Richard's uh, wife. And with that, I'm going to read... Uh, a recognition and make a presentation. The Pikes Peak Rural Transportation Authority wishes to acknowledge its deepest gratitude to Richard Robertson for his invaluable contribution to the PPRTA Citizen Advisory Committee, October 2019 through October of 2023. And uh, with that, I have a presentation uh, to Pat. And uh, if Jim and I will do that, we'll come up. Oh, yes. Get her in the middle. <laughs> Thank you very much. My husband loved these meetings. Back the week before, he was reading all the papers and making notes and what have you. But it really brought joy to the end of his life. Uh, somebody asked what his quality of life was before he went in the hospital a week before he died. And I said, oh, he was active, loved his transportation meetings and church and what have you. And so I thank each one of you all who brought joy to his life in the last stages of it. He just... Uh, gave him purpose and uh, the fellowship with you all was very special. So thank you very much. Thank you for sharing. Thanks, Pat. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I think uh, Jim's gonna have a few words. To yeah, I would just like to make a, a couple of comments, Pat. Uh, you know, Richard will be missed from our CAC group, uh, Citizens Advisory. Uh, if you knew Richard, you know he's um, not shy about expressing uh, his opinion on things. And uh, we were always assured to get Richard's opinion on, on a project. And if he didn't like it, you knew it pretty upfront. But um, <clears throat> uh, he was a great addition. And uh, we all knew that he had a tremendous background. And those of you who have read the, the, the what his background was in the in the um, funeral brochure, um, 
there were a lot of us that knew he was well qualified in what he did because he he talked about it a lot. But uh, we did not have the depth and the breadth in mind. And so Richard will be surely missed. And um, we're going to make sure that County 115 gets done in his name. <laughs> <laughs> he was all over getting funding for County 115. So, so um, but thank you very thank much. You. We, we appreciate Richard being with us. Well, I so appreciate each one of you. What you meant to yeah. One, uh, and Jim, one thing I do need from a formal perspective, I will ask for a motion to approve uh, the uh certificate that we gave so moved commissioner williams second uh councilman donaldson and mr president i'd like to say a couple words too if i if i absolutely could before we do that and um uh pat I, I remember well i read your husband's obituary in the paper whatever day that was it was published and uh and and i was really i was truly impressed i mean i, I kind of read the obituaries because it makes me feel like uh you just see how accomplished people are, how many things they've done. And and that's what I saw in Richard. I even read it to my wife because there were so many impressive things uh, in here, including uh, his graduation from VMI and, and the Army Corps of Engineers. And uh, I recommend uh, that, that uh, my colleagues read this. Uh, so thank you uh, for his service to the city and his service to uh, his country before that. Thank you there, uh, Director Donaldson. And with that, uh, I will ask, uh, we have a motion and a second and discussion. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? And it passes unanimously. And uh, Jim, over to you for additional Great. words. Thank you, uh, Jim Godfrey, Chair of the CAC. Um, we had our meeting last week. Um, very good meeting. Uh, we got a... Um, overview of the budget that's in your packet today um, uh, in in the uh, vein of being transparent uh, with uh, citizens that, which we represent on that committee uh, we ask each uh, government to please um, just give a highlight of their budget uh, versus us just taking it as in a, a document uh, the city and the county did that the others were small I had no questions so we had a, each of the uh, Gail and, and um, Jeff gave us a really good uh, overview of the budgets, and we appreciated that. And we make a positive recommendation for you to approve the budget uh, as being presented to us. Um, the next thing, City of Colorado Springs had uh, eight contracts. Um, Gail went over those very thoroughly. There were no comments or questions uh, um, from the CAC on those, and we make a recommendation to improve those as well. The next thing we got into was a, a good discussion on the IGA between PPRTA and CDOT on a grant for capital projects for some trail work. Um, Gail will go over that today. And um, we had a conditional approval of that. Um, it had not been, by the when we met, it had not been approved and gone through by the city attorney or the board attorney. And um, and so we kind of have a, a conditional uh, approval going forward that um, uh, it's pending the, the legal review from the city, pending the legal review from the PPRTA attorney, and then uh, allocating the grant funds um, to the, to the uh, PPRTA account was part of that too. So, um, You'll have that discussion uh, today, I'm sure. And then uh, other than that, that was um, uh, the chair will go over the recommendations of the reappointment subcommittee for a reappointment and appointment of the citizens advisory group members as, as that gets to the agenda. Other than that, any questions? Any questions uh, from uh, board directors? Um, any anyone else? I don't see or hear any, Jim. Okay, great. Thank you. With that, I would ask for a motion to approve uh, the CAC report. Mayor Dixon, also move. Thank you, Mayor. I'll second John Graham. Thank you, Mayor. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? 
I hear none. With that, the uh, Citizens Advisory Committee report has been accepted. Moving along to item number six, our financial report. Lisa is up. Lisa Corey, finance manager for the PPRTA. I do not have an updated monthly financial report. The September sales and use tax figures have not been made available to me yet. Um, so I don't have anything new there. I am expecting them early next week. Um, so when those are made available, I will email them out to everyone. Any questions uh, from the board uh, to Lisa? Okay, we look forward. We look forward to actually seeing those. Uh, and Lisa, if you would uh, mention uh, to the board what we talked about a little bit in our uh, agenda prep as far as uh, where we're at, to, just to remind board members where we're at uh, this time of year. Um, so through August, we are still above budget overall by two point three million. Um, so if we do have a, a downturn, we have some cushion to absorb that. All right, thank you. Any concerns or questions uh, on that particular piece of information? Okay, uh, moving along to item number seven, uh, the FY 2024 budget presentation uh, from, and uh, we discussed this in the agenda prep to actually go over uh, uh, the high points of the uh, 2024 budget. So we'll do an overview. And uh, Lisa is Lisa's gonna do that. Yeah, so we set the sales and use tax at 150 million and 6 million in interest. Um, so essentially $156 million budget. Um, for the administrative portion, that was set for $839,400, which equates to 0.52% of the overall budget. Um, and according to the ballot measure, we are allowed 1%. So we are definitely under that. Um, and with our budgeted figures, we rarely use all of what is budgeted for that. All right, thank you. And uh, did we want to hear from the different um, entities at all on uh, the 2024 budget? Does the board members wish to do that? Hear from the different, from the city, from the county, from... I'm not seeing... Go ahead, Buster. Um, I will weigh in. Um, if nobody else has a, an opinion, I think just for transparency purposes for the public, it would be good to uh, go over that information. Yes, I, I agree. So would we start with the city with uh, Gail? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Gail Sturdivant with the city of Colorado Springs. Um, the one thing I, I'm, if you don't mind, I would like to add a ask a question of Lisa as I present it because um, with the ballot initiative coming back yesterday, but it looks like Fountain is not gonna be joining PPRT at least for 2024. It appears that the maintenance numbers that we're presenting in our budget Excellent are all gonna question. go up. So I'll give you the approximation based on the Gale back of the napkin math and what we think that's going to be um, presented. But that, I think that's something that the city of Colorado Springs and the other member governments would like to see the revisions on the maintenance. Yes, Funny. and once we have a little more official um, results for that, I'm planning on revising those figures for the December meetings, and she's correct that everyone will have more to allocate in their maintenance, so those memos will likely have to change to whatever the new amount is. Um, that will definitely be part of December. Okay, great. Thank and you. We, just... And we discussed that in the agenda prep, exactly that. Okay, well, great. I just want to make sure that it was clear for for us and staff as I go through and do my uh, presentation. Mm -hmm. So with the, the total 24 budget of $156 million, um, that equates to the city's capital portion um, at $60,385,000. Um, the maintenance budget um, that was published, assuming that Fountain was going to join was $36,203,728. The approximate change to that would be closer to 37 Point eight million dollars, um, and then the transit amount would be fifteen million four hundred and ninety four thousand sixty dollars. Um, I'm going to focus a lot on the city's capital portion um, to start with. Um, overall, we program additional funding for A list projects. Uh, we have additional um, funds that were programmed that's shown in our capital improvement program for the Eighth Street project and added a million dollars. Um, for the South Academy uh, project, the south phase between Fountain Mill and Proby Parkway is $13.3 million. And that project we do have a bid on, so that's consistent with the bid and contingency for that project. 
Uh, the Circle Drive Bridges, we programmed and, and now budgeting for $9.6 million. And again, that's a project we have a, a bid for. So we're comfortable with that number. Um, the I-25 Nevada Tejon Corridor Improvements is $7.6 million. The Las Vegas Royer uh, Rail Crossing at $2 million. The South Cheyenne Canyon Bridge Project was $831,000. And that is based on, again, a bid price that we presented last month and contingency for the project. Um, the Union Pacific Bridge over Fontenero is 18 .9, 18 $18.8 .8 million. And the uh, Union Pacific Bridge over Tejon and Nevada for design, uh, we currently are still programming a million dollars for that in 2024. Um, what you'll see for programs, the capital programs that continue just to show our baseline numbers. And then I will point out on page 29 of your packet, um, there is a large carryover currently in the, or shown in the budget documents for the right-of-way safety traffic operations program and the interested, intersection safety improvements program. There is a footnote there to designate that, although that looks like a large money, it's because it's cash-based accrual. A lot of that funds, those funds have been encumbered to go to the uh, Mark Shuffle Road project that we've been discussing for the last year and a half. So I just wanted to point that out so you didn't see that big number and not realize that it has a contract associated with it. Um, on our maintenance budgets, we'll continue to focus on um, ro roadway maintenance, uh, bridges, uh, other structures in the right-of-way, um, and traffic signal maintenance within our public right-of-way. And on transit, um, the transit budget focus on local grant match, uh, providing transit services, and covering their operational costs. So that is the highlights of the city's uh, proposed PPRTA budget, and I'd be happy to answer questions. Any questions uh, from board members? Yes, uh, Director Donaldson. Uh, thanks, Mr. President. And Gail, you know, I hadn't really thought about this till there was that train uh, derailment recently. And I believe they're, they were responsible for the maintenance of the tracks there, correct? Yes, they are. But to the bridge itself, we have to build those. Um, <laughs> that, that This particular bridge on Tejon Street, that one's a little tricky, but in general, yes. So the, overall through the city of Colorado Springs, I think in every case, the railroad has senior rights. So when we have crossings, um, we tend to have, have responsibility for those structures. Is that always the case or is it say, well, well, the railroad is, it, it could still be kept, but we want to widen the road. Therefore we eat the cost or what are the guidelines? Are there any cases where the railroad itself would pay for the bridge? I have, there are two bridges in Omaha that I was responsible for where they had to pay for the bridges <laughs> because the city was there before the railroad. Um, but in most cases, when they go through and they, they do this railroad construction, uh -huh. today we could refer to them as construction and maintenance agreements that are intended to go in perpetuity. I think they've had various names in the past, but um, whoever has the senior rights, if somebody wants to come to a crossing, you enter into some kind of agreement with them to understand who's going to have the ownership, the division of operation and maintenance, and, and ultimately the cost responsibilities for those bridges. But in Colorado Springs, it's almost entirely typically a city responsibility because the railroad was here before the city. I, I will say the one that gets a little tricky on Tejon Street, because we have not gone and replaced the Tejon Bridge, mm -hmm. and it's 121, 122 years old. It is in poor structural condition. Mm -hmm. The railroad has operational concerns, so they're likely going to go replace it in its current location um, sometime mm -hmm. in 24. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Any other uh, questions? Do not hear or see any, and so I'll look to the county. Josh, if you uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Jeff Manchester, Deputy County Engineer, uh, filling in for Josh Palmer today. Um, just a few highlights on our 2024 budget. So our capital program budget um, this year is just over $24 million, uh, and our maintenance program is around $15 million. And again, that's um, uh, prior to the adjustments due to Fountain. Uh, just a few highlights from our maintenance program. Uh, we'll continue to focus on work items like our concrete, which includes sidewalk, curb and gutter, um, and our, all of our prep to paves. Um, we're continuing with our asphalt overlays, uh, gravel road maintenance, sealing and rehab rehabilitation, excuse me. Um, with the success from our 2023 pavement preservation program, 
uh, which is new to the county this fiscal year, we plan to continue efforts um, as we're, we've been very pleased with the performance we've been received out of that program in order to seal uh, good roadways and maximize their useful life. Um, just to highlight a few uh, projects on our capital program list. So we're, we're planning to allocate 4.4 million to Beacon Light Road, uh, 267,000 to Deer Creek, Creek Base Camp and Microscope Way, uh, 60, nearly 65,000 to Eastonville Road, uh, 19,500 to Academy Boulevard, and around $30,200 to West Colorado Avenue. Um, all these projects are A-list projects and they continue to remain priorities for the county. Uh, we look forward to forward progress with each. And with that, that's our, our 2024 budget highlights and I'm happy to answer any questions uh, from the board. Thank you. Looking to the board for any questions or comments to the county. I do not see or hear any. All right, thank you, Josh. Now for our other entities, uh, I can reach out and uh, if you if you want to discuss it, if you don't, that's fine. If you don't have the people here to do that. I'll start online first. Uh, I see Paul Belt is uh, up with us today. Again, welcome, Paul. And uh, not sure you want for, for Rayma, if you have any uh, comments about uh, the 2024 budget from your perspective. I'm not sure Paul heard me. Hello. Hi, Paul. Uh, Hi. I, I was just saying, yeah, go ahead. We had uh, $8,390 from the uh, budget, and we're going to spend it on drainage improvements throughout the town and street sides. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll jump over here to Calhan to our Mayor Pro Tim Gardine. Okay. Okay, we're going to be using our uh, 2024 budget maintenance amount of 57000 on uh, street improvements, potholes and repairs, and street signs. Thank you very much. Um, and if I can be so bold as to congratulate uh, Mayor John Graham uh, on what I think was a victory last night. So we'll be keeping him here with us. And with that, Mayor, if you have anything you want to uh, discuss on your 24 budget, the floor is yours. Thank you. I wish I could be as cheerful about this as you are. <laughs> it looks like <laughs> two years of hard work. Nonetheless, I'm excited about that. Um, for our budget, we do have our city engineer, Dole Grabenik, here. I think he probably has you know, some deeper insight into the details. So, if uh, Dole, if you'd like to give us the walkthrough and if, if, if other directors have questions for you. Uh, thanks, John, <clears throat> and welcome back, or continued. Uh, I think what you'll really see here is that Manitou is really focusing on our transit shuttle parking, which is our Hiawatha site. This is going to be our proposed transit and mobility hub, so we're really focusing as much of our capital money into this as we are proceeding to try to build this into this big, wonderful thing that we've envisioned for quite a while. And then on the maintenance side, we are going to continue to – we're actually – um, adding more capital money of Manitou's capital money combined with the Manitou or with the um, PPRTA maintenance money to really increase our, um, like I'm being like charged. Like, yeah. <laughs> like, go for it. Yeah. Um, anyway, we were, are really putting a lot of money into our maintenance program as well. So we are paving a lot of streets, chip seals, sidewalk improvements, things like that. All right. Any questions? I do not hear or see any. Thank you very much. And uh, finally, uh, Mayor Todd Dixon, uh, again, welcome. And yep. for 2024, you know, project wise, we're going to be focusing on our repayment of the loan mm -hmm. for our Stilling Basin. Maintenance wise, um, with the disaster declaration of El Paso County that we tagged along yes. on, um, there's potential for a significant impact. Uh, with the basically the FEMA dollars. Um, if it's large, then our maintenance money will just go back to basically buying road base and and uh, helping uh, take care of our roads mainly. The um, the potential is, though is is there with the FEMA money, especially under mitigation, um, for us to possibly 
go after maybe putting in up to 100 culverts to help with stormwater drainage. Nice. And so there's this potential that's looming mm -hmm. out there that we are still trying to go after with the FEMA money. But if that doesn't come come through, then the maintenance dollars will actually go back into uh, maintaining our roads. Thank you very much, Mayor. The last uh, piece is uh, in on item seven is public comments. Uh, I will look once again to see if we have any public comments online uh, for the but 2024 budget and out in the audience, uh, public comments, I uh, hear and see none. With that, um, if there's no other comments or questions from the directors, board directors, I will uh, close uh, out item seven on the 2024 budget presentation, reminding that we will vote on the budget in our December board meeting. With that, moving on to item eight, our uh, 2023 capital maintenance and public transportation contracts. First up is Colorado Springs, Gail. Thank you again, Mr. Chair, Gail, Servant, City of Colorado Springs. Uh, the city has eight contracts for your consideration today. The first one is for the Academy Boulevard reconstruction project. It is an A-list project and there is a map I'm including your packet, and we're focusing specifically on that south segment that runs from Milton Proby Parkway um, to, um, to Fountain. Uh, this is for engineering services during construction uh, for AECOM. We have previously excluded those items uh, or that item until now. I know we will be adding that in as the contractor will be getting in earnest on the south phase immediately after the first year. Uh, this change order is an amount of $248,575. Uh, city's second contract this is for the Galley Bro Road Bridge Replacement Project. This is also an A-list project. There's a map included in your packet. Um, the city is ready to go to construction for this work. Uh, we went for an invitation for bid, and we had four respondents. Um, in addition to the bridge replacement at this location, Colorado Springs Utilities will be installing a water line um, underneath the bridge and then have tie-ins going along Galley Road, so they're a significant partner in this project. Um, we had out of the four bidders, K.R. Swordfurger was the low bidder um, for a total of $5,276,576. Um, for the bridge portion of that work, that is $3,624,043, and that is the PPRTA portion of that contract. City's third contract is for uh, Circle Drive Bridges, also an A-list project, and um, Instead of like a map, there's really kind of easements that are shown included in your packet to understand what we're going through. But as um, Director Donaldson asked earlier about the railroad bridges, since we typically enter into these construction and maintenance agreements, those are the agreements that go in perpetuity with the railroads to understand who pays for what and, and how it's maintained and operated over time. Um, we did just finalize the construction and maintenance agreement with both railroads. Um, for the circle drive bridges and in it we are required to pay for both uh, temporary and permanent construction easements for BNSF Railway and the Union Pacific. Um, the total for both of those is $355,224.25. Uh, the, the city's fourth contract is the first of two traffic maintenance contracts. Uh, this is for the purchase of ATC controllers, cabinets, and EVO radar. Those are not abbreviations. That's actually the name of the radar systems that we were going through purchasing. And we went through an RFP process. We had three respondents. Um, we are selecting Ecolite control products um, for a base year contract for an initial contract value of up to $200,000. Um, and when we purchase those materials, then the uh, city staff goes and uses those and incorporates those into our roadway systems or into our traffic network systems. Uh, this contract would have four individual optioneers associated uh, with it. Uh, city's fifth contract is also for traffic operations. Again, we went through an RFP process. Uh, we did have one vendor for this one, and it was for to purchase school zone flashers and FLIR cameras. Again, so those can be purchased or it goes installed around school areas. Um, the vendor is with AM Signals with an initial contract value of up to $200,000 um, with four option years pending renewal. 
City six contract is for the PPRT program and bridge asset management services. Uh, the city went through an extensive uh, RFP process in 2022. Uh, we, we had three respondents. We selected Ellis Gallegos and Associates. Uh, they've been performing that service for in 2023, and this will be the first option year. Um, that would be in the amount of $3,635,725. And that is paid for under a variety of capital projects and some maintenance activities, particularly associated with bridge maintenance. City seventh contract is for uh, the renewal of on-call contracts. Uh, most of these contracts were went through an RFP process in 2020, and this would be um, their second option year for renewal. There are some others that are in there. Um, any task orders or change orders, um, to be done under these on-call contracts would be done so in accordance with policy 30, depending on the dollar value and service being provided. And this is this is not the first time you'll see this. This is just the first batch. You'll likely see at least one more, if not two more packets of renewable on-calls. Um, and then the city's eighth contract is for transit bus purchases. Uh, city went through an extensive RFP process to get um, bids and information for battery electric hybrid and various lengths of diesel buses. Uh, we had four respondents. Uh, the city selected Gillig Inc. or LLC uh, to provide uh, services. Underneath this on-call contract, uh, it will be for up to five years and the city will have the ability to purchase up to 50 buses. Um, underneath this first, uh, first contract, we are looking at purchasing uh, seven buses. They will most likely all be the 35 foot diesel buses with this first um, first purchase. Um, the reason why you're seeing this one, because we, we need to inform the board when we're doing these large capital, or these bus purchases. But two, also with this contract, the, the local match, um, let me back up. The, most of these buses are paid for at least in 80 or 90% with transit formula funds usually 5307 funds, sometimes 5339 funds, and the local match is provided by PPRTA, usually in an amount of 10 or 20%. Um, the local match for 2024 is coming from the transit operating funds. In uh, the future years, so the local match could potentially come from PPRTA capital dollars underneath the um, uh, bus purchase program. So, so it's two reasons to bring the contract before you because this is, we're talking about just the first year and there are likely um, four other uh, renewal option years. Um, I will just give you kind of an order of magnitude depending on the type of buses we purchase that our total contract value for this could range between 31.5 to $56.9 million from a grant standpoint. So the local match over the five year is anticipated range between 6.3 and $10.8 million. And those are the city's um, eight contracts for your consideration. I'm happy to answer any questions. Any questions from uh, board members, uh, Director uh, Donaldson? Thanks, Mr. President. Uh, thank you, Gail. Just on the buses, are these buses to be added to our current fleet or to replace uh, aging buses. Yeah, these are really to replace aging buses. Um, and Land can talk about this more in the transit report um, if you'd like to hear more about it. But we've uh, we really did not do a great job replacing buses on a normal routine basis starting around 2014. Mm -hmm. So frankly, we're behind in replacing buses. Um, in fact, we've had to pull some buses out of retirement just to keep our fleet operational. So we're really trying to work in earnest to replace our buses. Uh, these 35 will help replace retire retired diesel buses that are currently uh, being used today um, under this contract. And if you're just kind of curious, we actually, this is just what we're talking about this contract today. The city has a couple other grants where we're purchasing uh, six hybrid buses from two different, three from two different manufacturers to do a hybrid bus pilot. Um, and then we have another grant uh, that's a dual grant between the city, I'm sorry, between the state and the federal government to purchase two more battery electric buses and to do our second battery electric bus pilot. Um, I believe Lynn has reported out to you before and she'd be happy to share more information. We had our first battery electric bus pilot. We had four buses for Proterra. Frankly, it did not go super well and we had a hard time keeping more than two of them operational at one time. And now that manufacturer has gone bankrupt. Um, so not only do we have a hard time keeping them operational, we had a hard time getting replacement parts. So we're really trying hard to 
have a methodical approach to looking at and incorporating um, alternative fuel vehicles into our fleet, trying to do it as smartly as possible and leveraging special grants to bring those in to make sure we're not using our regular form of funds to bring those in until we know we're going to have something that's going to be operational for us and we're going to be able to get replacement parts. Uh, the wonder thing gets somewhat complicated um, with these alternative fuel vehicles as with the Buy America Act. Uh, two, three years ago, frankly, there was really very few bus manufacturers that could meet those requirements that met all of our federal requirements at the same time. Um, now we're seeing more and more of them come online, but we still want to be methodical about bringing those into our fleet testing them out, make sure they're going to be, there's not unforeseen mechanical issues, make sure there's not supply chain issues, to make sure they're going to incorporate our, into our fleet, and that they're going to be able to provide a comparable service hour um, operational benefit as some of our diesel buses. But it is part of Mountain Metro's um, overall a vehicle replacement to look at right-sizing the vehicles if it makes sense to change the size of the vehicles on some of the routes, and two, to uh, strive for a goal for a zero-emission fleet. Good luck. Um, two other questions that we could. Uh, I'm not sure. Are these numbered? The, the one about the school zone flashers, that contract, $200,000, is this separate and distinct from what the city's considering raising the speeding ticket cost for to cover the cost of those flashers, or is this part of the same? Um, this it, it's it's probably a little bit of both, frankly. Uh, we have um, existing school flasher systems that frankly we need to go maintenance on or do replacement parts, so we could go get the replacement parts for the existing systems, and then we have the ability to go and purchase mm -hmm. um, new equipment underneath this contract to incorporate in those new uh, twenty six crossings. Because I thought the idea was that was going to be funded um, by these increased fees on traffic right. tickets. It wasn't going to. Mm -hmm. I didn't know anything about, and we're going to also tap into PPRTA funds to make yeah, this most, happen. Yeah, I would say most of what you're going to see in um, for the new flash, the 26, are going to be coming out of that general fund item with the increase that we talked about. Um, we do, again, we have existing school flash areas. We can do this. Underneath this contract, we can use both general fund money and PPRTA money. But our intent for those new locations was to use the general fund money that you heard presented in the budget. Okay, and then the final one is uh, the ATC controllers says this equipment prepares the city for future advancements in traffic management. Um, do, you, do you have more information about that? Uh, what kind of future advancements are we looking at there? I will speak generally about it. I'm not familiar with that specific piece of equipment, but one of the things that we're really looking at is doing perception-based detection at our signals. In fact, we, one of the grants we have, we're doing a pilot on 50 intersections where uh, with the technology that they can perceive, like if it's a, a pedestrian crossing or a bike crossing, or if there's vehicles going and 90% of your traffic's going on one road and you have very few interruptions on your side road, that in that it can be a smart change or adaptive changes so that adaptive mm -hmm. perception-based signalization is really what we're going for. And it required us to start um, bringing new technology into our cabinets. And if you wanted more specifics on that, you're going to have to get somebody who is a little. Yeah. Todd uh, Frisbee's talked to us about this okay. to some, to some degree, the current controllers being used by the city are not able to interact with much of the new equipment being introduced. Okay. Thank you. I have a couple of questions too, Gail. Um, on back on the flashers, is it been is it been in the past? I think it has been in the past that uh, for the existing flashers, not the new ones, that this additional mm -hmm. fee is going to do. Uh, has it been both a uh, work uh, both from the city? General fund as well as PPRTA on the existing budget. You know, frankly, I'd have to go and confirm yeah. that. Mm -hmm. I I think it's been a blend, but I don't know for certain. Okay. And the final piece was on the electric buses. Uh, the have the has the risk factors been measured and evaluated to determine as we tend to move into more electric buses, mm -hmm. the risk factors of of not providing the serve the transportation services if we continue to have problems uh, supporting them. Oh, are you talking about adding more vehicles yes. into the overall um to the overall so, risk? Uh 
Yes, I think that keeps laying up at night, frankly. Um, and I'm sure she'd be happy to talk about it more when she does the transit report. But um, the good news is, well, it's not good news, but um, some of what Mountain Metro is experiencing is consistent with what other transit agencies are experiencing around the country. And, and Land has pretty good and frequent okay. co conversation with um, the FTA. And some of it was legacy supply chain. Um, but frankly, but it's, Mountain Metro's situation was compounded was they were not on a routine bus replacement starting in 14. So they had some catch up to do as well. And that's one of the reasons why Lan and her team have been super aggressive with the discretionary grants in addition to the formal funds, because we have some catch up to do okay. on our buses. So what she's done, and I've actually, I have some really good notes about it. What she's really done, because we have a bus shortage, is she's been moving buses from different services. So let's say your typical bus would either be a 30 35 or 40 foot diesel buses because we're short on them. They've been taking the cutaway buses that are typically used for paratransit service and rotated those into fixed route service. So right now um, she's got 14 of those, those uh, cutaway buses that again, we're normally used for paratransit and the fixed route mm -hmm. to supplement what we have just to be able to provide services on our routes today. And then to backfill what, um, paratransit needs, she's been taking some of the, the van pools since they've been underutilized and rotated some of those minivans into paratransit service. So basically shifted vehicles, the smaller vehicles into a more traditional, larger vehicle capacity role to help meet our needs. If we continue to have crashes or continue to have that deadline vehicles or to continue to have issues with supply, we, we may be in jeopardy and have to look at cutting fleet, uh, cutting routes, but we're hoping that's not the case. I mean, in fact, she was just able to get 10 new cutaway buses put into her fleet in just the last couple of weeks. Okay. So we'll we're working with we'll the We'll give her problem. a chance to yeah. elaborate. You can tell we, we spent a lot of time talking. <laughs> it's apparent. All right. Thank you. Any other uh, uh, any other contracts? Uh, it was it. just those eight. Okay. Thank you. Um, <laughs> with that, I will ask for a motion and a second to accept uh, the Colorado Springs contracts. Commissioner Williams, I will move to approve. Thank you. Mayor Dixon, I'll second. I have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Uh, hear and see none. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? I hear none. With that, uh, the contracts are approved. All right. Um, also, then moving into the uh, IGA. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Gail Sutton with City of Colorado Springs. Um, I want to give you a little bit of a reminder of history on this. Um, back in the middle of 2022, uh, when uh, State of Colorado had their first uh, call for projects out there underneath their new multimodal and uh, mitigation option fund, um, it op opened up a lot of opportunities for state funding. Um, but most of the municipalities that were eligible for it here in the, the Pikes Peak region uh, were hesitant to take it because it was going to impact Tabor caps. Um, back in July of 22, we approached, June or July of 22, we approached PPRTA Board and established Policy 31, where it really put a process in place where the member governments could bring grant applications forward for the board's consideration to act as the applicant on behalf of the member government. In July of 22, um, PPRTA board did agree to uh, be the applicant on the City of Colorado Springs for three uh, different grant projects. Uh, the first one and the one we're going to spend the most time on today is the three trail crossing project, which is also referred to trail crossings at the at, um, for the Homestead Trail, uh, the Woodman Trail, and the Skyline Trail crossing. Just as a reminder, the other two projects, one of them is for buses, and you'll see that coming in the not too distant future. And then the, the third one is for the Centennial over Sinton Trail uh, crossing. But those are not the two we're talking about today. Um, now, we did uh, have successful grant awards um, by CDOT. So the next step is for us to enter into an intergovernmental agreement or IGA between uh, CDOT and PPRTA. Um, city, just as a side note, the city enters into these uh these IGAs uh, routinely, and I believe the county likely does as well uh, for these grant uh, agreements. So most often when they send us these draft agreements, there's very little to no change on them. We, frankly, it's really getting the names right of the points of contact, 
uh, verifying the math is done and getting the project name correctly and the scope of work that has to go through there. Um, so the city has received the, the, the draft grant award. So now we're at that next step under policy 31 where um, it needs to be considered by the uh, PPRTA board. Um, one of the things that both the city do and does and then what PPRTA would do is to do a final legal review to make sure there's nothing that would um, compromise or create issues between either the city or PPRTA in this case. And then once it's awarded, we would be asking the board um, for consideration upon approval that it becomes be considered a, a budget allocation act, action. Um, so we have the ability to um, leverage a contract um, against those funds in the future. Um, right now, the city's legal staff is finalizing their review. Um, once it's done, then it will go to Ms. Ivy for our PPRTA's legal counsel um, to finalize review and then it goes back to CDOT for finalization. Um, I do have a copy of the um, grant application that was included, um, which you considered in July of 22. I have a copy of the draft IGA with the red lines that we're anticipating. Um, and we'll say beyond the red lines that are in there, there are two instances where the word agency was used and it should have been authority when referring to PPRTA and those will be added. And then I believe Rick just passed up policy 31 for your information. Um, Neither the city council and I would think anecdotally uh, uh, PPRT's council are not as anticipating substantial changes from the IG as presented here today. So what the city is requesting is that the board would conditionally approve the IGA based on the outcome of the final legal review from PPRT's legal council. And the city would also request that the board approve a budget allocation in the amount of $535,000 in MMLF funds to the city's PPRTA on-street bikeway improvements program upon execution of the IGA. Uh, one final thing just for you to consider is that um, if you would choose, one option is for you is to delegate uh, the digital signature authority of the IGA to the, which is routed through DocuSign for signature uh, to the PPRTA board secretary or Rick Sonnenberg. So just something for you to think about um, on that, but really the city is asking for your conditional approval to enter into the IGA and uh, for that pending budget allocation following execution. So that's my overview. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Gail. Yeah, we had quite a bit of discussion on this in the uh, agenda prep uh, with concerns about not only has our attorney not had a chance to uh, view everything, we haven't had a chance to look at the agreement. And so my question is, what kind of timeline are we really on here? So we have some flexibility in the timeline. Um, we can't do anything with the project until this is executed, but um, this is one of the reasons why I brought the simple one to you first, a simple project to you first. So if the, there was questions or if you had direction or request for us to change the process, um, taking, you know, try to put the package together the best for you to look at based on what we did on policy 31 work a year and a half ago and this grant. So we have time on it, but I'd be, I would ask if there's input or other things you would want or see um, related to this. I, I think it's my understanding that the reason uh, our attorney hasn't had a chance to uh, look at it is because the city, uh, Colorado City City attorney hasn't given a, an evaluation of that yet. Is that is that correct? Uh, that is correct. Um, she does a routine review on all, on all these, but we, again, we very rarely make changes to these IGAs. All right. Um, and I offer I offer uh, comments uh, from other board members on this. Yes, uh, Vice Chair. Yeah. So my concern, and um, of course Jennifer Ivy can jump in if I'm um, misstating any of us uh, of our conversations, but um, without having it actually reviewed by our attorney, I'm not really comfortable with moving forward in an approval. And I I think. Um, while there may be a lot of boilerplate plate language without really seeing that and having our attorney review it, I, I'm not comfortable and, 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 you know, approving something. I think we need to wait if, um, if we do indeed have some time on that, I think that would be wise and prudent. Yeah. And I, and I think that's, that's my, my direction too, is I would like to see us have the opportunity for our attorney to be able to review it. And give us a rec give us a recommendation based upon that review. Just, yes, Count uh, Director Williams. 
I, I do apologize. It's getting to be the afternoon. When is the deadline for the grant application? Well, the application's already in. This is the IGA to actually get the money underneath the award we've already received. Okay. I apologize. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Yes, uh, Director Donaldson. Gail, um, you know, the second part of this is uh, approve a budget allocation of 853000 to the city's PPRTA on street bikeway improvements program. What would that be? What would we spend eight hundred and fifty thousand dollars improving on street bike stuff? So this is specific to three trail crossings. The total okay, project please. that was valued for one million nine hundred and six thousand mm -hmm. dollars. So the grant award would be half that that five hundred or eight hundred and fifty three thousand dollars. So what this would do would be would be more robust trail crossing. So the first one would be the Homestead Trail Crossing where it crosses Dublin Boulevard. Mm -hmm. uh, the next one would be where the Woodman Trail crosses Rangewood. And then the third one was where the Skyline Trail crosses at Mirage Drive. So they would go through engineering and actual construction. Are they making like grade separated uh, crossings? They're going through tunnels or above or, or what? This would all be at grade crossings. So there'll be lights? And... Signals, lights, likely some concrete work, um, striping, signage, um, typically warning beacons, things like uh -huh. that. But these have not been designed. But I would imagine, yeah. if you're familiar, there is one that we put in at Rangewood. Uh, I believe it's the Cottonwood Creek Trail last year. I would imagine it would look very similar to that if you're familiar with that location. No, I'd I'd have, I'll go show. look. I'll go look at one. So the cyclist would pull up and push a button, and then the light would change, and then be able to go. That's the idea. In general, yes. Right now, they pull up, look both ways. Typically, play for and that's for a cyclist. So one of the ones like the Rangewood one I know I've seen. We actually have a lot of families that walk on there, so it's it could be both pedestrians or cyclists. Okay, thanks. Yeah, so I and now I'd like if if Jennifer would uh, make a couple of comments here. But really nothing to add. I mean, the process is outlined is that the city covers the cost of the PPRTA's legal review. And so for efficiency's sake, there's really no point in me reviewing it prior to the city attorney being done. Um, Gail and I had emailed about that last week. So, uh, I mean, I think for future, maybe just to make sure that the process moves along before we get it on the PPRTA's agenda. Um, but if the board, you know, doesn't feel comfortable conditionally approving it today, I would just ask for it to be tabled to December since we have more time. I'm going to move that we table this till December until we get the proper legal reviews. I second that. Okay. I have a motion to table and a second. Further discussion? I hear and see none. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? I hear and see none. With that, we've tabled uh, till December. But I do think it's a, it, obviously it's a great thing, IGA. We just need to finalize it. All right. Uh, with that, uh, moving along, that was uh, item eight. And moving along to item nine, member governments and other reports. Again, we'll start with uh, City of Colorado Springs Transit Services monthly update. And welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, good afternoon, members of PPRTA. In your packet is our September ridership update. Um, as you remember, we had zero fare for better air campaign this summer, and we set our record ridership in July, then in August. So we were very happy about that. September tracking the ridership, they did fall back to the non-zero norm, unfortunately. And this is similar trend um, that happened last year when we were able to offer one mm -hmm. month in August at zero fare and September ridership did go back. Um, thanks to zero fare, we were able to achieve 90% year to date ridership um, as of September compared to 67% uh, in 2022. So since we didn't set the record ridership in September, we're moving on to other topics. In our packet, we included a ZEP update. Uh, we've been asked um, 
recently we, we've received a few questions from different uh, groups and member members about the ZEP ridership. How is it working? It's a little over one year into the service. Um, so we included some program update for you in this packet. There is a the chart um, about ZEP boardings by month in your packet. We we saw a increase, pretty steady steady increase of the ridership since the um, the start of the program. Um, however, starting June, July, and August we saw that ridership slightly lower than uh, previous months. We don't know exactly why, because this is the nature of a fixed route service. We do not track the individual rider. However, there are some contributing factors that we think might have uh, contributed to this lower ridership. Um, those, those considerations are included in your packet. Um, as Gail just mentioned, we are struggling um, with vehicle shortage and have been using the smaller um, ADA Metro Mobility vehicles for the ZEP service. As a result, those vehicles are or could be confusing for our riders. They are less recognizable as those ZEP buses. We are in the process of working with a, ven with a vendor to uh, paint them different a different color than than white so people can see and recognize them um because of the metro mobility vehicles being used for fixed route we do not have all the it equipment inside the bus for example ridership count um the gps location so we don't have everything all the um uh, all the, inf uh, the the information technology systems inside the bus therefore the drivers are counting passengers manually so there is a chance that ridership that we captured is not 100% accurate. Um, also during the free months, a uh, free summer, uh, people had more options to ride MMT buses, not only on the ZEB. ZEB is a free service, but we also had 919.4 in, around the downtown area. So people had more choices. Um, and also reduce frequency again because of the vehicle shortage. We have been forced to reduce that um, service frequency from seven minutes to 14 minutes sometimes. And that is not helping with the ridership. Also, we haven't had a one full year within one calendar year to keep really keep up with the trend. We don't know if this is a seasonal service. Um, CC students, summer events, school tourists, those could also affect ridership. So we'll continue to monitor those. Um, the, the second chart that we included in um, the ZEB report is really a, a, a measurement to capture the efficiency per se. Uh, instead of just looking at ridership it, as the only measure of how the service is doing. We're also looking at how many passengers that we have per that bus revenue hour. Um, from the start of the service, that's the, the blue line, the lower um, line that you see, we started with pretty low ridership per hour from one to two to three. And in um, our spring service changed this year in May, we were able to reduce that Free peak vehicle need. We we also call that as peak pullout from five vehicles to four. So we were able to reduce one vehicle and use it for other services while maintaining the frequency. Um, so that's why that free that ridership per hour has been increasing from May a little dip in June, but it has been pretty consistent over at five, and we're head, headed into six uh, ridership per hour. So. In a sense, that's a better use of the resources that we have. Um, that's a quick update of the service. Um, we will continue, continue to monitor that uh, service performance and report back um, from time to time to the board. Uh, we have kicked out uh, our 2050 long range plan process. Earlier, there was a question about um, how basically how responsible, what are the risk factors when we purchase vehicles? We included a zero 
um, emission vehicle transition plan in this long range plan as one component to look at, okay, here's the goal, um, ozone reduction, air quality, but also what are the other factors we're looking at? Are we looking at one to one when we replace vehicles? Are we looking at one could be battery electric, could be hybrid to replace one diesel vehicle, or are we looking at something that we have to purchase two vehicles if the range is not there? Mm -hmm. What's the, the operating cost? What's the replacement? What's the annual depreciation compared um, that long-term cost, the life-term cost of a vehicle, alternative fuels vehicle to what we have today. So that is part of the long range plan process that we will be evaluating as well. That's all I have for the report. Okay, uh, thank you. Any uh, questions? Uh, yes, Director uh, Donaldson. John, thank you for the report, Alan. On uh, page 105, you know, we see the ridership by month. And it went up in August and came back down September. Do we know how many people, not how many trips, right? 350,000 at the peak. But I would imagine a lot of those go somewhere and then they come home. So that person maybe counts as two rides, but it was one person. Do we know how many unique riders we have? We don't on the fixed route service. Do we have a, an estimate? Like, hey, we think at max 5,000 people are riding the bus or 1,000 or... In the past, we've basically used the round trip as a simple calculation. Basically, it's one trip to your destination, one trip back, but that's not always the Divide case. by two, yeah. Yes. But then I do that 20 times in the month. So I'm one rider and I've done 20 trips, uh, you know, and they're each coming and going. So that's 40, 40 of these rides are from one person. Do any bus services monitor that somehow? I'm not, I don't know totally how you would do that. If they had a car or something like that, or some kind of an ID, you could, we could figure it out, but do you know? Uh, with mobile ticketing, there is a potential, um, but there's also, um, a, a large majority um, percentage of our riders who don't use that. So, but it's it's something that we could use down the road. Um, another way is the rider survey. We still don't have the final um, study back. Rider survey could give us some information, but it's okay. not a one to one. Um, I, I think that would be interesting yeah. to know is how many people are really riding the bus outside of trips, which you know, we don't know what to do with that. Um, I'm not sure if we can, but I'd be, uh, I would be interested in it. Uh, I think others, others would also. Thank you. Yep. I think we'll have some information in the writer survey when we're ready. We'll um, share that. Before. Thank you. Okay. Um, anyone else? Okay. Lynn, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, moving on to item 9B, uh, Colorado Springs uh, monthly change order and acquisition report. Uh, Mr. Chair, Gail Student City, Colorado Springs, the uh, the change order log in it is two pages and the real estate log are included in your packet. And I'd be happy to answer questions should you have them. Any questions? Give it a moment for people to re again review it. Yes, Director. Can you, can you share with me, how can you get the print any smaller? Yeah. <laughs> I can work there, that look on the screen. The goal. There on the screen. <laughs> That's how. <laughs> I could have made it one page. <laughs> no, that's good. <laughs> Okay, um, and if somebody finds something, we can come back to that. I'll move along uh, now to Josh with the uh, El Paso County. Thank you, Mr. Time. Chair. Uh, similarly, we've included the change order report and property acquisition report, and I'm happy to answer any questions. It's small too. 
It looks we found it looks like it's smaller even. Look at this. <laughs> Fortunately, reading it uh, digitally, I can expand it and then, then able to read it. Yes, uh, Gail. Uh, Mr. Chair, I actually had one item I did want to point out okay. on the second page of the, the, the city's change order log. If you recall, those of you who are on the board, uh, two years ago in August mm -hmm. of 2021, we had one of our bridges struck, uh, El Paso yes. Bridge that goes over Pikes Peak. We finally finished our claim with that, and uh, we are returning, paying back basically the money we borrowed for PPRTA um, as far as the studies and things that needed to go in, in preparation for that. And then the rest of the money will be going in the city's general fund to support the replacement project in the future. So thank you. I just want to make sure you knew that we do make sure we bring money back when we're supposed to. Very, very well done. Okay, any further questions for either the city or the county? Yes, Director Donaldson. Kale, is it always the case that, hey, if there's a change order on here, it's because of X and Y? And then what are X and Y? Is it because the stuff was more expensive, labor was more, or should we really do this, like, get it briefed? Like, okay, uh, number one, the change for this reason. Number two, change for this reason. Uh, well, typically these are on call, uh, on call, smaller on call contracts that are below the thresholds that we bring for mm -hmm. CAC and board approval in most mm -hmm. cases, but some of them are additional um, funding for like maintenance or contract ad. But again, there are always, this is done in accordance with policy 30. Mm -hmm. Of course, policy 30. Um, <laughs> I think we had three months of discussion on policy 30 at least. We did. I might not have been here. I don't know. Um, so is it is it uh, the case that, uh, and, and, you know, my apologies, we just have lots of stuff on our plate, so I didn't study page 111 too, too deeply. Uh, South Academy Boulevard reconstruction, fountain and jet wing, PEA amount was 9839 Improvement damages rounding 677 total amount. Maybe I'll get with you uh, separately and go through this. Yeah. But is there a general explanation you would give the new guy? Hey, new guy, what you're looking at here is is this. And that's why these numbers are changing. I, I Typically, I could if, if there's specific, you know, with the log, I can show you what most of them are. Most of them I know off the top of my head. Um, every once in a while, there's, I have to go and ask somebody else on my staff what they are. But I, I try to do that before I come here. Okay. I'll, I'll get with you separately. All right. Thanks. All right any other uh, questions? Okay. With that, uh, we'll complete item nine and move to item 10, administrative actions and reports. First, the city of Fountain. Believe it or not, we actually have to do an action today, even though we think we know what's going on there. So I will look to, I think, uh, Jennifer to talk about that. Yeah, so originally we had published the agenda and the materials and expecting that um, the <laughs> votes would come in a bit differently for the city of Fountain's ballot measure. Um, so... The next step, if if the ballot measure were to pass, would be to set a public hearing for December 13th and direct staff and the City of Fountain to provide the notices for that. Um, as of noon today, it was a 288 vote differential um, voting down the measure, which is 10% with the number of votes. Um, so it's not looking promising. Um, with that said, um, reports from the county are they're still counting ballots. So it's possible. I'm saying there's a chance that <laughs> these results could flip. Um, because of that, and because it seems silly to have this board potentially hold a special meeting, my recommendation is that the board today conditionally set a public hearing for December 13th and direct staff in consultation with the city of Fountain to review the unofficial results and make a determination on the 15th of November, whether the results are such that it looks like this measure is going to pass, in which event the staff and the city of Fountain would then provide that notice and we would hold the public hearing. Um, from a legal standpoint, there's no detriment. There's, there's no reason not to hold the public hearing. Um, we could have the public hearing and say, well, the measure didn't pass. And so 
this is a moot issue. Um, from a practical standpoint, that would require the city of Fountain to mail notice to all of its electors, which is a huge administrative expense, which is why I'm kind of asking for this conditional direction based on the results, because I'm going to suspect that the city of Fountain doesn't want to mail out all those notices if they know that it's not going to pass and they're just throwing money away. Um, so the request would be for that conditional setting of the public hearing and direction to staff to work with the city of Fountain to make a determination based on the city's unofficial results, which we believe will be available this week, but um, definitely by the 15th, which is next Wednesday, uh, to make a determination whether that public hearing is needed. And if a public hearing is needed to mail the notices, uh, publish and publish the notice, um, and those all have to go out by the 23rd of November, uh, which is Thanksgiving. So practically speaking, it's really the 22nd of November that they have to go out. So moved. Yeah. <laughs> Second. All right. I didn't even have to. That's great. Jennifer, any further? You really got to shorten these motions. A little yes. bit. <laughs> so, any further discussion, or does is everyone clear? Uh, yes. Uh, Mayor Dixon. Director Second. Dixon. I'm seconding the motion. Oh, okay. All right. So we have a motion and a second. Um, I would ask for further discussion, but I don't want to. <laughs> All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? I hear and see none. The conditional public hearing with the direction to the staff is set. Thank you. All right, moving along to item 10B, a legislative uh, report. And I think, Dan, Dan, are you uh, up online with us? Yes. <laughs> you took a potty break. He is online whether while well, he's looking mr chair while he's connecting maybe i could uh, I, forgot, I, I forgot to hit the unmute button yes we can me? dan uh, uh go ahead oh, perfect go ahead and uh rick, rick or jennifer were you going to cover the memorandum yes. uh, yeah yeah rick, or, rick, rick is if you let me go ahead and do that yes uh, we received uh, an email from the executive director of CASTA, which is the Colorado Association of Trans Transportation Agencies, um, highlighting an issue in the RTA state law. Uh, there, in the RTA state law, there's a revenue source that the PPRTA does not use. It's a lodging tax. It's a uh, in the statute is called the visitor benefit tax. It has a 2% cap, but the 2% cap is uh, cumulative of what any city or county or uh, our other RTA might pass. So if a, so it's an absolute cap for RTA. So if cities and counties use up the 2%, then there's no margin for an RTA to use that revenue source and go to their voters and ask for approval. So the executive director of CASTA has floated this concept of potentially f trying to find a, a, a sponsor for a bill that would um, have the 2% be in addition to what any city or county uh, had a, a, as a way in the way of a lodging tax instead of being capped cumulative with what any city or county was also doing. So. The uh, and, and Jennifer or Dan, feel free to supplement my, my present, my overview. But so the, the question is uh, obviously, this is not a revenue source that the PPRTA uses. The question is conceptually, do you want to weigh in on, uh, uh, and you haven't seen a bill yet, do you want to weigh in on the concept and give direction to uh, PPRTA staff to give some feedback to uh, the executive director of CASTA? Uh, do you want to just wait until you see a bill? Do you want to, uh, you, li you like the concept, you don't like the concept, you want to monitor uh, or take no position? So that's my overview. Uh, Jennifer, do you want to supplement? Uh, yeah, just to, uh, this is, since it's not a legislative session right now, we wouldn't actually be taking an official position. Um, uh, to distill this down to a little bite, this is not something that impacts the PPRTA. So I don't, there's no harm to the PPRTA. It helps other RTAs. That's great. 
Um, the concern that I would have is just anytime you open up a statute, you have the possibility that once it's introduced in the legislature, you're going to get other revisions and those other revisions might impact the RTA. Um, so at this point, I know that it's enough to be overly concerned about it, um, but I think it's just something to ask Dan and staff to monitor at this point. I don't know that the board would want to be in favor of it necessarily since it's not a revenue source that this district, or this, district this um, RTA is using. Yeah, and I'll add to Jennifer's point, um, you know, as I read the thing and went through the thought process is very few bills get through committee or the floor that don't get amended. So if this bill does come out and it does move forward, it is something that we'll have to be very vigilant on checking the language and checking amendments to make sure it doesn't drag us in, certainly in a negative, a negative light. So um, you know, that, that's sort of where I'm at on that. And I don't know. You know, my other question to the board and, and to Rick is, do you, do you want us or myself digging around to see who had the who if they got a bill sponsor, who the bill sponsor might be? And then once we see it, letting that letting them know behind the, the magic of the black curtain, what our position is and to make sure that the bill sponsor protects that as well. So I think those are some of the options in the ways I think we should do this. But obviously. Uh, we can't do anything without the guidance of Rick and Jennifer and the board. All right. I, I suspect at least <laughs> my brain hurts just trying to think about this particular <laughs> issue. <laughs> so <laughs> is, is, is this something we want? I think what our options are, if I can see if is to monitor this, with uh, both Dan and uh, Rick and Jennifer uh, monitoring this, or do we actually want to do some action? So am I am I laying that out properly for the Rick and Jennifer? I, I would think it, I would think if we did any action, um, it would be just to make sure the the possible or behind the bill, what we were, our position was, so that it doesn't get amended to affect us, um, would be, I think, what I would think our only actions would be. It would be certainly be a more passive action, but I'll leave that up to the board and Rick and Jennifer, if we do anything at all. Like I said, this hurts my head. So <laughs> sufficient to give direction to staff, including yeah. Dan, to monitor and to bring back any additional information, including bill sponsor or anything that's garnered the next couple of months. I mean, we're not in the session right now. So I think, you know, no action is yeah. really needed. It's just direction. And for that direction, though, we need to take a vote to actually give direction. So any discussion? So Director yeah, Donaldson. Yeah, thanks, Mr. President. Is is this a real problem? Has, has any RTA hit the limit and they can no longer raise taxes? Not that I'm aware of, uh, based on the emails uh, back and forth from the other RTAs that, that responded to the cast executive right. director. So I'm, I'm uh, so short answer is no. I, so I can add to that though. Every month at the Statewide Transportation and Advisory Committee, Committee, which is through the Pikes Peak Area Council of Governments, I brag about the Pikes Peak RTA. So it's probably my fault. They're probably wanting to get into the action on this money. And then when they looked at the RTA statute, they realized they couldn't because of their uh, lodging tax in their cities already. I don't think this has to do with lodging tax. This is simply a restriction on, on RTA, Regional Transit Authority taxes, right? I think it, the, the LART tax is separate. No, it's the it's the RTA component of the lodging tax. So it's limited, and Rick, I think you understand a little better than I do, but it's currently limited by the portion that's being taken up by the other municipalities. And so this is removing changing that cap so that they, there's no possibility of hitting that limit. Okay, this is why Randy's brain hurts, I think, because mine's going to start now. <laughs> the inclusive 2% uh, cap on total lodging tax collections for RTAs. So LART is collected like to be used for promotion of tourism, 
in, in Colorado Springs. That's something else. This RTA tax, which you could do on a, a lodging tax, I think is separate. Maybe that's a question you can find out, um, Dan. Uh, I don't think LART would would be part of this. I think this is if, it seems to me this is saying if, uh, where is it say? Especially uh, the closer uh, lodging tax collections. Uh, it seemed to me that what this was saying, if there were two, maybe I'm misunderstanding it, but two jurisdictions trying to collect a road, uh, a, a road tax, it would, it would limit that. That the. For RTAs, there's mm -hmm. an absolute 2% cap. Yes. If any city or county use up a portion of that total, that bu if they fill up the bucket, then there's no margin for an R. If they use up the whole 2%, then there's no piece left for an RTA go to go to their voters and ask for a, a piece to be approved as, re as a revenue source for that RTA. So. Yeah. It, it, but what I don't understand is if they use it for what? Because we have a tax on lodging. I mean, they pay 2% general fund. They pay whatever on, uh, I believe they do, like, uh, what's what's the one for safety, public safety sales tax? I think all that's in there. Uh, I thought this was really saying just that the RT tax for roads is capped at 2% for roads, regardless of who's imposing it, the city, the county, uh, or someone else, or an, or an RTA. Maybe we need to do further research. Uh, my understanding is it just falls under the generic definition of lodging tax or visitor benefit tax, regardless of the purpose so that, okay. That the, the, the RTA, an RTA obviously would be in the transportation business, but a city or county might impose a lodging tax for a different purpose than roads, but they could consume a portion of the total two percent and not and leave less than two percent or zero left for an RTA to use a lodging tax regardless yeah. of the purpose of the lodging yeah. tax. Yeah. Okay. Then I'd ask for that clarification because maybe I just misunderstood it the first time through. I was thinking it had strictly to do with tax for roads uh, applied to lodging. But what what you're saying is it's any tax applied to lodging that's unique to lodging. That, that's my understanding, but we can, that's my understanding, but we can do some further research and, and report back. So I just want to add it a little bit, and and uh, Dan would certainly be able to speak to this much more clearly than I can, but there were some changes uh, to the lodging tax uh, recently, I believe, uh, in the legislature where um, it, the, the ways in which you can use that was expanded. So for a period of time, um, I think it was only for use on tourism, and I believe that the uses on that were expanded. That might be where this is coming in, is that now that those uses have been expanded to be able to be used on roads and such, um, that this would that this is a kind of a secondary and... Uh, Second, third order. Yes, effect of that, that now that it can be yeah. utilized differently. I don't know, Dan, am I remembering any of that correctly? I, I you know, I, yeah, yeah, I think you're spot on. As always, Kepler, um, and, and yeah, and I think to the point you guys clarified earlier, this, it, it's not the tax on roads, it's just strictly the lodging tax. And I think Twadjus, Wauke's, Memo is she's trying to find more money for other RTAs throughout the, the the state is how is how I read that. So I think you're spot on, and I just think it's something we need to monitor very very closely. And I don't think this will be the last thing that we see session coming up. That sales tax or any other kind of taxes um, moving forward. Let me let me try to say so as I understand it, this does not affect us right now. There is a potential, whether small, medium, or large, it has the potential once the, uh, the legislature goes back 
into session that it could affect us. So right now, we're looking to just monitor what's happening and uh, have a game plan if it starts to look like uh, a bill sponsor is starting to to affect us. Did I say that right? All right. Yeah. So I think I want to make a motion for us to monitor and have our staff, as well as Dan, uh, keep tabs on this for us at the board. Mr. Chair, I just want to point out Commissioner Gonzalez has his hand raised. Oh, I did not see that. Director Aye. Gonzalez. I uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So uh, I'm going to ask because you say it does not uh, affect us. Does it not affect us because the RTA does not have a lodging tax, or because the lodging tax that the call that our largest uh, you know income person uh, entity Colorado Springs theirs is not large enough when combined with our PPRTA tax. Uh, to put us to some sort of cap, because there have been, if, if the second part is accurate versus the first, there have been discussions of Colorado Springs doubling their tax. So my question would be, if it's the first, it doesn't matter. But if it's the second, what would happen if, say, Colorado Springs tried to double their tax? Would that end up pushing us to some sort of cap where we now have to uh, it, it does affect us. So that's my question. Is it is it because the PPRTA does not have a large tax or because what we currently have in the city is not large enough to affect us? Thanks. It's because we don't have a lodging tax. So the RTA statute allows for property tax, sales and use tax, lodging tax. We only use sales tax. Okay, good. All right. Thank you. Then that makes sense for monitoring, I think. All right. Um, I'll second the motion Thank to monitor. You. Okay. Did we have a did we have a motion? I was just you asking. Did. I did. <laughs> sure. <laughs> I'll, I'll I'll make the motion to monitor if okay. everybody is comfortable with that. I'll second. Okay, we have a we have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? I see and hear none. That motion has passed. Um, and again, thank you, Dan. Any other, was there any other legislative, no any other legislative pieces? Dan? No, I there, I have not, nothing else that will be affecting the RTA right now. Okay. We're uh -huh. just busy interviewing candidates and moving forward. Thank you very much. Mr. President, could I ask yes. uh, Mr. Jablan a question? What's uh, the mood up there, Dan, after that voting last night? <laughs> it's the same as it was before the voting. Everybody hates each other. Okay. Uh, um, <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, but I've, I've heard through the grapevine that there's going to be a special session. There is or is not. That's I've heard through the grapevine. Yes, there is. That's what's going to yeah, happen. No, I've heard. I, that's I good. heard the same thing, but it's not uh, necessary. I don't know when that's going to be yet. And is it going to be on property taxes? That's what I understand too. So. Yeah, I mean, it, yeah. It, they they have to be a single subject. To it is. Right. Okay, moving on to item ten C. Appointments, uh, reappointments process for our CAC uh, members. Uh, we held, uh, and I, does, Rick, does everybody have the minutes? Not yet. Ah, I'm sorry, go ahead and pass those out. Um, while he's passing those out, we can do one thing. We can either take a quick break or we can get through everything else that we have left to do. Um, yeah. Yes. Absolutely. We'll have Rick do that. Um, we held our subcommittee meeting last week. Uh, and we uh, went through the process of looking at candidates for the CAC. Uh, as it turns out, three of the candidates, we, uh, we voted to approve to move forward in uh, their second terms. And uh, I'll have Rick read off all the names here in a minute. I'm just giving a highlight. 
And then we discussed at length uh, two dip, two positions, uh, an at-large, a CAC at-large and a CAC at-large alternate positions that the two individuals were terming out in. And uh, instead of just reappointing them in the reverse positions, one going from the at-large to the at-large alternate and the at-large alternate going over to the at-large, hope I said that right, we uh, voted to move forward and open up those two positions uh, to do interviews in. And to include those two individuals could also then obviously uh, apply to interview for those two positions opposite of what they were doing. Uh, because as I understand it, uh, those individuals were really good. And I, I, I was going to say, is Jim, I know Jim has to, is Jim left? Yeah, Jim and Larry did. Uh, anyway, that's that's what happened. And Rick can uh, talk to it a little bit too. Thank you, Mr. Chair. As the, the board re will recall, the, uh, the board's uh, approved bylaws for the CAC uh, requires that a certain uh, percentage and a certain number of the CAC members uh, have terms uh, on alternating basis so that all the CAC terms don't come up at the same time. Uh, the, the second major feature of, of the CAC bylaws is that the CAC members from member governments are appointed by their respective member governments. That, that leaves the at-large and at-large alternates that are uh, appointed uh, by the board, but by a uh, board approved policy, uh, that policy sets up a three member subcommittee to review the applications uh, when at large uh, CAC members and at large alternates uh, terms come up. Uh, the subcommittee is the board chair, board vice chair, and the CAC chair. Uh, and they met uh, last uh, Friday. Friday. Yes, last Friday the 3rd at 1 30. Uh, and the, the board policy requires that uh, I notice the entire board because it's a special board meeting, even though it's intended for the three, but it's uh, noticed to all the board members so other board members can attend. And as you can see from at the bottom of the one page uh, uh, minutes that uh, um, Director uh, Graham and, and Director Donaldson uh, 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 attended the meeting. So the five uh, at-large and at-large alternate CAC members whose terms were up were Ed Dills, Rick Hoover, Emily Magnuson, Tony Joya, and Rich Zamora. The, uh, the subcommittee is recommending to the full board that the full board reappoint Ed Dills, Emily Magnuson, and Rich Zamora, uh, and... Um, to uh, additional terms starting January 1st, but that the, uh, the Tony Do Joya and Rick Hoover uh, stand and wait for uh, staff to advertise um, in the newspaper for additional applicants, as well as uh, my pulling from the file uh, last year's five candidates who were unsuccessful and, and asked them if they're still interested to to compete. And then uh, once I've uh, we've reached the deadline of the advertising and I've contacted the five unsuccessfuls from last year, then we'll set up another subcommittee meeting and the sub subcommittee will review all applications at that time. So it's it's a two part recommendation from the subcommittee to uh, Immediately approved for January 1st, Ed Dills, Emily Magnuson, and Rich Zamora, and uh, for Rick Hoover and Tony Joya to wait until the, the outcome of the advertising and they can compete uh, against whoever's um, um, ap applying at the time. And with that, I will uh, ask for, I'll do two things here. I ask for a motion to accept results of the subcommittee meeting so moved second with that i'll open up i have a motion and a second discussion if uh, anyone's unclear on what we're doing as it's been said a couple of times we're approving the second terms of the three individuals that have been mentioned and we're opening up uh, for advertisement 
uh, the two at large, one at at large regular and one at large uh, alt alternate position. All right. Any further discussion on that? All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? I hear and see none. Uh, that motion is approved. All right. Uh, and uh, with uh, Tim D, the fun fun part now: appointment, reappointment of board members. Um, that's that's all of us. <laughs> so our city and town and community um, attorneys, I guess, uh, or excuse me, uh, boards uh, have to nominate us again, all of us, and then we'll come forward before January 10th, which means um, this needs to be done, I guess, in December. And I'll let Jennifer and Rick talk to that. The uh, board's bylaws uh, mandate that the board's, the board director's terms are the calendar year. So um, it, this is just a reminder, and I'll have another reminder in December for, for you if you care to be reappointed by your respective board trustee, city council, county commission, uh, that you need to pursue that. And Jennifer Ivey likes to have those appointments in writing um, back as soon as possible, but no later than the uh, January board meeting to confirm that you've been reappointed for 2024. And we, and for, for the city of Colorado Springs, we'll do that at the latest at our December uh, council meeting to vote on us, th uh, the three who are going going to be on this uh, the PPRTA. El Paso so. County will do that on January 9th, which means we'll let you know. That's our reorganizational meeting, so. Right, Carrie? Right Sorry. In writing. And <laughs> I'll make sure that they have the letters done immediately so that the chair can sign them as soon as we're done with the reorganization. I appreciate that. The only thing uh, I would add to all of that is that also in that January board meeting, uh, we will elect a new chair and vice chair with the chair being on the county side and the vice chair being on the city side as we do every January. So just as a reminder. Yeah. Anything else on item 10 Delta from anyone? Any other discussion on that? Okay, uh, with that said, uh, we're going to move to item 11, which is PPRTA member announcements. I'll start on the left with our Mayor Pro Tem, Cardine. I have none at this time. All right. Council Member Donaldson. Uh, I also have none at this time. Thank you. Mayor Graham, newly reelected. Thank you. Congratulations. Uh, yeah, no, nothing at this time. Thank you. Mayor Dixon. Still working FEMA. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, I'll jump online first before I come around here to uh, Paul Belt. Uh, nothing, thanks. Uh, Commissioner Gonzalez. Uh, congratulations, uh, John, on your re-election. And I'm uh, just trying to get my head back after that whole... Uh, uh, RTA discussion we just had <laughs> it was very confusing on the uh, uh, on the lodging tax, but I, th I think we finally understood it. So thanks. Oh. You bet, M Mr. Uh, yes. uh, Mr. Chair. If yes. I could, I thought that uh, the good commissioner uh, with the Air Force credentials was going to say he was still trying to recover from that Army beatdown on the Air Force I, football. I, I team. thought we, I thought we could get through the day without that. Yeah, I, I will. I, I was going to wait until my turn. The rest of the evening, but the six yeah. turnovers is hard yeah. to overcome. I will congratulate uh, the Army, United States Military Academy, the Army, for they they earned that game. They showed their dominance and uh, demonstrated, especially their quarterback number thirteen, that uh, uh, the, it it doesn't matter when the service academies play one another. You can never guarantee what's going to happen. With that, uh, I will ask uh, Council Member Avila if she has any uh, comments, announcements. Commissioner Williams. Uh, happy Veterans Day on Saturday and happy Thanksgiving. Very good. 
vice chair. Okay. Well, I'm I'm also going to say um, Happy Veterans Day and thank you to all uh, who have served. I know there's many here, uh, and including spouses. And yes, um, and, and I'm going to razz Holly a little bit here because I believe she made a Go Air Force Beat Army yes. statement uh, at our meeting. And I, I you know, I first the game. That's right. And uh, as an Army spouse, I uh, I'm I'm pleased to get to say here uh, today that. Uh, her, her cheering for the Air Force team didn't make it so. So proud of the Army team as well. And I need to always remember I'm an Army daughter. So <laughs> Interesting. Yes. Uh, would you please share that with your husband? Absolutely, I will. You know, I think, uh, I, I think most of my Army friends know that I did not, I, I did not make an issue out of it. And I, congr- I immediately congratulated them. Uh, on that uh, on that win uh, and, and actually i wish i wish army uh best of luck against navy because if navy wins then the air force keeps the commander in chief's trophy just thought i'd throw that out there because we had it last year that's why i wish army the best so they can win it outright i hear an apprentice involved with that <laughs> we just want the broncos to get one win <laughs> right any other uh, i'll go across the room uh, any on the back uh, side there around? Uh, okay. Uh, online, no further. With that, we are adjourned. See everyone in December. Mm-hmm.